And so thank you very much for inviting me to speak. I don't get to speak very often because there's only four of us. I'm not allowed to leave the museum very much. Um, so it's a real honour to be here today. Um, I've had to write it all out so I can get everything in because I want to get as much in as I can. So uh, forgive me for reading. Um, here we go. So Hackney Museum is a community museum. Um, it explores the history of migration to the local area in Hackney. In one of the top 10 most diverse boroughs in the city, focusing on migration is hugely important. So from our school sessions to our exhibitions and our collections, all of our programming and projects have migration or diversity right at the heart of them. And the story starts with Anglo-Saxon migration to Hackney, and this is our Anglo-Saxon boat in the middle of the, the museum here. Um, and it's the idea that we are all migrants in the UK. It just depends how far back you go in time. The narrative of our museum follows on... What do I do here? Um, with the different reasons why people have settled in Hackney over time and how different communities have helped to shape Hackney. The museum was set up with communities, uh, with local people who told us their stories and gave us their objects, so you can see their stories and hear them in the displays still today. With Brexit and the rise of um, racism and the far right in the UK, this is an incredibly important narrative to weave through our programming for children, families and older people, and for migrants and non-migrant visitors to the museum. But it's also at the heart of our permanent displays in the museum. So it's there to see and explore every day in the museum, not just in one-off projects with different communities. So we've been working in an engaged way with communities for um, 15 years to collect, preserve and share the diverse history of Hackney. And we've amassed a great deal of knowledge about how and why community engagement is so effective in Hackney Museum. I've had the privilege of working at the museum since it opened, um, and I could see, um, sorry, uh, moving up the chain of responsibility from a frontline schools officer working right at the bottom of the pay scales up to being a manager with a more strategic role in the museum. But with a team of only four people at any one time, staying connected with the work on the ground has been incredibly important to the way my role has developed and grown within the museum. So working in a frontline role as a schools officer for 10 years, I could see the issues and the stories and the challenges um, that our communities faced firsthand. But I always felt really frustrated about not having any power to make any real change for the people that I was working with. Um, partly because of my role, because I was pretty low down. Um, partly because other team members at that time haven't always shared the ethos that's so strong in the museum now. And partly because of the way that the museum was perceived by the local council, the local government that, that fund it. It was always just a good news story, um, a nice little museum, but not much more than that for a long time. But I always believed that we held um, the key to answering some of the bigger problems in Hackney but I lack the power and influence to really help to bring the changes to light in a significant way and to affect real change for local residents. So over the years, I and the teams around me that have come and gone have been embedding the museum in the community, but also embedding the community in the heart of the museum. So in the 15 years that we've been opened, I think we've worked on two projects that have had a budget of more than £50,000. Um, but the majority of the time, we're working with budgets of under £5,000 for an exhibition, mainly £2,000, that's usually what we're given to spend. I have £500 for the whole year for schools, so we're very, very small money. So most of the time, we're working with, very not, with not very much at all. But through the projects that we've worked on, which I've been connected to and learned through, um, we've started to gain a real understanding of how and why we work in the way that we do. And we've realised that whilst initially we always felt frustrated about not having enough money and not having enough staff, actually, when you work with small teams and have no core funding, the power balance between communities and the museum is shared. And the relationships that you build with them are much more resilient and long-lasting because they were never about money, uh, but about something much deeper, a much deeper connection that then we found lives on. And we don't just work with communities because of a strong and shared core belief that it's the right way to spend the taxpayers' money because they're funding it. We also work with them because we simply couldn't work in any other way. We don't have funds to work on big, large-scale and glossy projects, so we have to build networks. And we have to work strategically to get things done for mutual benefit. 
So in this presentation, I'm going to explore two case studies um, that demonstrate how we carry out the core work of the museum, collecting stories, collecting objects and developing exhibitions and programmes, but also how we've been using these outputs um, to bring about real and long-lasting change for local residents. So, we have collections relating to African and Caribbean, Caribbean migration, settlement and presence in the local area going back about 400 years. And currently, the African and Caribbean um, population of Hackney is about 30% of our, our local residents. Now, in the 1970s and 1980s, somebody thought it necessary to collect campaigning material related to the deaths of young black men in police custody in Hackney. So here's a poster from 1983, um, when four young men died in that one year in Stoke Newington Police Station. Other material that we have in the collection explores the community campaigns that have emerged as a result of these deaths, images of the protests organised by the mothers and the local communities, and newspaper articles that document events leading up to and after the deaths occurred. So this means that in 2018, when we are faced with similar challenges as a, as a community, community, and very recently a young man was killed by a policeman in a shop in Hackney just a few months ago. Um, it's a very frequent occurrence in Hackney, unfortunately. Um, and you may, may have heard about it on the news, but it's, Hackney ha has lots of, uh, lots of problems like that that we, we have to deal with every day in the museum. But what we found is we, our material that we have is helping people today to navigate their trauma by reflecting on the past. We don't have extensive collections, but we're realising through this work that many of the missing pieces of the jigsaw for these stories still exist in people's lofts and under their beds. So all of the time we're working on these projects, we're trying to encourage people to think about their own collections and how they can help us to fill gaps in ours and why it's essential that they do so we can tell the most rounded and honest history of Hackney that we can. I mean, every local borough, police station and council will have its own records of, the events like, of events like these, but does every museum or archive across London hold information about the events that occurred in other spaces and tell the other side of these stories? And what does it do to a story if only one side of that history is preserved? So what we've found um, working with young black men, their families, and the people involved in designing services for this demographic is that using a historical lens through which to explore contemporary problems allows people a critical distance from the, own tra <coughs> the trauma that they're feeling right now. So with the local council, we've been working on a 15-year program designed at improving outcomes for young black men that uses our historic collections as a starting point point for the police, mental health teams, youth services, the gang unit, probation teams, schools and the young men and their families and wider communities around them to have very challenging conversations that up until now haven't been very effective in community spaces because the pain and the trauma in those spaces have been too intense. Neither do these conversations reach conclusions in kind of more conventional council spaces because the mistrust and the fear of the council and the services um, that support these young men is too great. And the anger means that the conversation very rapidly breaks down or ends up in a repeated cycle of talking about cuts and austerity and racism, which um, are true, but are not very productive conversations to, to be having. So together with the policymakers for the council and the directors of the different services across all of those teams that I, I mentioned, we as a museum are exploring how using the stories of young men in the past can help us to have honest but more productive conversations about why some of these problems haven't gone away, haven't been solved, and in some cases have got worse. We, of course, don't just focus on the neg negative aspects of this history, but also explore and collect the inspirational stories of young black men in Hackney in the past and today, who have shown incredible resilience in the face of the racism or misrepresentation they have encountered in their early lives. The counter-stories of the young men who didn't end up in gangs or police custody, who deliberately or indirectly as a result of their actions provide a challenge to the stereotype that we are given of these young men by the media. 
and therefore within their stories provide inspiration, strategies and amazing tales of entrepreneurship that we can all learn from. I always get goosebumps when I see that little face. So this is Vivian Usherwood, and he was a young Caribbean boy who attended school in Hackney in the 1970s. He, he was in foster care, he lived in foster care, and had problems engaging in schoolwork, like lots of other young Caribbean men did then, and do now. Um, but a teacher at the school noticed that he had a real talent for writing, and he encouraged him to express himself through poetry. The teacher took Vivian to a local community bookshop, and this book was the first book that they ever published as a bookshop, the work of a 12-year-old schoolboy. It sold 8,000 copies, um, and mainly to Hackney teachers who were struggling to reach their young men in their classes with material that spoke of their own kind of cultural experience. Sadly, this Vivian died at the age of 21. Um, but we've recorded his history with the teacher that we managed to locate, who, who, who helped Vivian. And we're trying to trace his family um, to try and get more of a rounded story of, of him. And having his book in our collection is incredibly valuable for the reasons that I've spoken of. And the fact that he died um, is particularly pertinent when we're working with groups of young men, because lots of them, after learning about Vivian, are like, we're going to do this for Vivian. We're going to kind of live out the legacy that he, he couldn't live out. He wasn't able to live out. Um, so many of our collections that aren't specific to African and Caribbean communities also reveal stories that help us to fill in the gaps in this history. The article on the right, we see a mention that's highlighted in blue of Dudley Dryden, who's protesting against racism and inequality on the steps of Hackney Town Hall in 1978. But we've also recently found out through our community networks another side to Dudley Dryden, who, in addition to speaking out and attending protests on behalf of the community, was also making and selling African Caribbean hair oh how did that happen? African and Caribbean hair products on a local market. And he's now a millionaire as a result. His story, and you can see his book there, look how they made a million. Um, his story has an incredibly inspirational message that yes, it's okay to get angry when you see bad things happening in your community. It's okay to stand up for your rights, but you also need to be thinking about how you're gonna be making your own money and how you're gonna survive, thrive, and be resilient in the face of the structural, structural races, racism that you've experienced in your life and you will continue to experience. These are things that we can't solve on our own. So how are you going to build your own strategy and discover your own agency? Other newspaper collections, mainstream newspaper collections, also hold amazing stories that help us to reveal how whole communities have come together to speak out about racism and injustices in Hackney in the past. And whilst researching another exhibition about the independence of Jamaica and Trinidad, we came across the article on the left-hand side which has become one of the most used items in our collection with a range of audiences. So with this group of young men, <clears throat> we used the protest article and wider African and Caribbean collections in our uh, museum following a series of riots across London that happened in Hackney as well in, in 2011 that have left deep rifts within the local community. We used these articles to support them to try and explore the problems that they saw in their communities, but also in the wider communities and the wider world. We wanted them to talk about those problems through their own eyes and their, and their own experiences and write their own protest letters. So the boys were invited to the Houses of Parliament um, and they worked with a professional lyric writer to turn their letters into songs, which were exhibited along original archive material in an exhibition at the museum. Now this exhibition came at the height of rising knife crime in the borough and highlighted the need for council services and communities to do more to understand and tackle the problem together. So from meeting the young men um, who were kicking up a bit of a fuss in the museum, they, they were all right in the museum, but in the library upstairs, they were getting into loads of trouble and nobody really knew what, knew what to do with them. So we took them into the museum and said, you know, what do you want to do? And they said, we're all rappers. And we're like, yeah, we know. Um, <laughs> so we used this collection to help draw out some of the deeper underlying issues in Hackney because a lot of the, the raps that they were writing were about, you know, having big fast cars and hoes and being in America and stuff like that. So we wanted to kind of bring them, connect them back with their own experience in Hackney. So from meeting the young men to actually exhibiting their work, it was only three months. So... This indicates like, how flexible you need the whole team around you. So this is where working in a team of four people is really 
really good because the exhibition officer and I were like, right, we're going to tear up the exhibition schedule and get this in because this is a really important um, problem in our community right now. So when um, the when we launched the Improving Outcomes for Young Black Men programme that I spoke about, this came just before that. The museum was able to show, you know, we've already done this work. We've already kind of modelled how it can work using our heritage material to talk about difficult problems. Um, so we were demonstrating it and showing how, if this project was scaled up, we could do that for other young men in Hackney. So I'll play you a little bit of the, their song just to break up my voice for a bit. Bear in mind they are like 13 year olds, so there's a bit of poetic, they do talk about migration, but they also talk about, but they talk about the knife crime that they see, but they also talk about girls, because you know, we have to give them the freedom to talk about what they want. All my people here, they back me. I got bars, but I'm not in prison. All my roles, they're on a mission. We're trying to chase this thing. Make your girl go insane. My parents came here for a living, not for the stabbing and the killing. No, this ain't the life that I'm living. This ain't the life I was thinking. I'm loving life right now. So what's up all of the crisis? Now the places that we're loving are threatened to be by my ISIS. They wanted to talk about it. So all of these concerns and worries that these young men were having were coming out. Um, and just to go back very quickly, oh, I'm going off script. That's really bad. I'm not very good when this happens. We'll still be here in an hour's time. But this... Um, <laughs> This article here talks about the protest letter that was written in 1963, and the opening title of it was, We, the young people from the youth clubs of Hackney, strongly believe that we are faced with the most important issue of our times. And in the article in, the 19, in 1963, they're talking about fascism. But we gave the young men that as the starting point for them to talk about the most important issues in their times. And they talked about terrorism, but they talked about peer pressure, guns and gangs and knife crime. And there were that age, that kind of 11 um, to 13, where it was a very real fear for them going out of their postcode and into other postcodes and getting caught up in that world and having families that they need to provide for, but no strategies to do that. Um, so the policymakers and um, the councillors who saw this exhibition realised the potential of the model that we had experimented with, and now it's at the heart of a new programme for Hackney. And I don't have any evidence of impact to share because it, we're only two years into this project. But what's amazing is it's a 15-year project. This is a real commitment by Hackney Council to trying to, to, to attack. We can't tackle structural and institutional racism and on our own, but actually 15 years, we can start to chip away at that a little bit in the context that we're working in. So it feels like a really important project to have heritage recognised in. Right, back on track. Um, so part of the success of, this, of the Young Black Men programme, which has brought the museum and policy writing teams closer together, has been the council realising the potential for heritage and creativity to be a crucial part in designing council services and writing policy more broadly for Hackney people. So during this period of working more closely with policy writers and the equality teams at the top of the council, I was finding ways to have a voice and for the marginalised communities that I work with to have a voice in the more strategic and formal aspect of policy writing. So one of the most successful outputs um, of this more joined up approach to working with and for residents has been in our work with lo local LGBTQ communities in Hackney. We have incredibly high levels of LGBT people in Hackney and it's widely seen as a safe space to be LGBT, although there are, there are very high levels of crime against LGBT people. It's considered as one of the safest places to be um, in London. So at the same time as Hackney Council were rewriting policies about designing transgender inclusive services and looking at how to make their LGBT staff network more inclusive and effective, the museum launched a drive to collect and share more of the borough's hidden LGBT history. This was something the museum was doing anyway, um, and nothing we have funding for. Um, it's just part of our ongoing work to address gaps in our collections. Um, but with the support of other council services for this work, we were able to have a bigger reach and a real impact. During this period also, I'd started to forge a relationship with Project Indigo, which was a counselling service for young LGBTQ people living in Hackney. And this group are incredibly marginalised. Not only are they 
um, 25 LGBTQI young people, 75% of them have a learning and physical disability, and 80% of them are from a black or Asian and minority ethnic background. So you can imagine the multiple challenges that they face navigating all of these identities together. And that's why um, they've been referred to the group Project Indigo through the counselling that they were having. Um, so over about 18 months, I took the time to get to know them. It didn't take an awful lot of my time. I just attended their session. They had a group session after individual counselling where they talked and made art together. And, um, but taking my time was significant because in those 18 months, I started to understand about the, the real need for anonym <laughs> anonymity um, and to really understand the individual circumstances and sensitivities that were playing out with the different individuals within that group. Some of them um, were in Hackney, you know, 17 year olds who've had death threats from their families and had to leave their families and escape. Um, some of them, the counselling group was the only thing that they did other than go to the doctors and stay at home. So this group, it was so important that I knew and gained their trust and worked with them for a long time before we ever tried to do anything public or open. So these additional needs and the cultural backgrounds also meant that most of the group experienced barriers accessing council services and had a deep mistrust for the council. And even the group leader, um, who was battling the council at the time to stop cuts to their counselling service being made, it was, it was a difficult start. Um, but over the two years, the museum and Project Indigo started to get to know each other, with me attending the sessions, and the young people who initially wouldn't come near the museum eventually attending small launches um, and closed sessions to explore and reflect on the LGBTQ history we were collecting. Working with this group, we started to understand how this material could be used to help young people in the group to navigate their own journeys and their complex identities. And for many of the group, this was something they'd never, ever done collectively. So the solidarity between the group began to grow and strengthen, and the, as, and the barriers between each other and us began to be removed. We managed to obtain a small amount of funding from the council that enabled us to employ a queer artist to work with the museum, actually an artist that, that's working with Tate, as, or was working with Tate, we're not going to talk about her, um, to come and work with us. <laughs> it's nice that actually we've worked with like Counterpoint Arts as well. There are lots of different people that are moving between small museum and big institution. It's, it's interesting to see how that's playing out in the UK with the dialogue that's coming out around that. Uh, but I'm not going to go there. Um, <laughs> So that we wanted the, the artists to work with them to explore the, the personal identities, but also the collective voice that would come through the exhibition. Um, in the exhibition, individual identities were presented in the bedroom context, and more um, the collective struggle that they experienced as a group became, was presented on the battleground. So helping young people to feel represented and gain confidence was something the group felt, other young people, was something the group felt very passionately about. So alongside the exhibition, we provided training for council staff and local teachers in how to create more LGBT-friendly spaces and services, and the young people, ones that could be identified, came and helped support run those sessions. Um, and as the young people's confidence grew, so the collective voice they grew found, grew louder. And I was able to take their ideas about the barriers they face and their mistrust straight to a top level so it could be heard and reflected in the policy being written. So Hackney has a great track record for engaging local people in policy writing. It's far more radical than um, other local authorities. But as a symbol, symbol of bureaucracy, they still face enormous challenges, speaking to communities that feel let down, pushed out or excluded by the council during austerity, which has led to the closure of many safe spaces for LGBT people and BAME people to meet. Um, in the face of gentrification and the mainstreaming of services have also led to the specialist understanding of these groups often being lost within the staff teams of the council. The community are feeling the impact of austerity and Project Indigo are feeling the impact on multiple levels. Hackney today is unrecognisable from the Hackney that I started working in 15 years ago. Huge amounts of money have been flooding into the borough. And as a result of regeneration or gentrification, we don't talk about it in those terms in the council, but effectively what it is, um, Hackney has been able to rebuild all of its secondary schools and radically transform rundown areas. But the flip side of this is that a family home now costs £1 million. 
And when you look at the statistics and realise that 40% of children in Hack Hackney still live in poverty, you can see how the impact of austerity and regeneration together has brought huge challenges for the young people growing up in a borough that they'll never be able to afford to live in. So the impact has been huge, but the opportunities to get it right for Hackney people is realised by the council, who consistently get high ratings for its work to tackle inequalities within the borough. Part of the reason for this high rating is the way that it involves local residents in improving the council service design and in its regeneration programmes. I'm not saying that it's perfect and that everyone feels included. And every day I meet people who um, have been let down by the council, so they're not getting it right all the time. Um, but it is a Liberal council, it's a Labour council, um, and it is working much harder than it did in the past to ensure that the services that they design are more accessible for new and existing communities. And when I spoke at a policy meeting during the LGBT project about how challenging the young people at Project Indigo found accessing leisure centres in Hackney, actually, in fact, none of the young people in Project Indigo felt comfortable using a leisure centre in Hackney, um, because of their disability, their gender, fear of abuse or being misunderstood in those spaces. But the policy team listened. So whilst the exhibition that was developed was amazing, and I'm not focusing on, because we all do amazing exhibitions, and, and so I haven't really put any exhibition content. I'm trying to get kind of the nitty-gritty and the, the other bits of it. So it was an amazing exhibition seen by 7,000 visitors, but one of the unexpected outcomes of the project um, and as, as a result of the museum policy and leisure teams working more closely together, this small group of 10 young people have helped architects to design two new leisure centres for Hackney. Um, and this piece of work has come directly out of the museum who forged that relationship and gained the trust of those young people and instilled in them a confidence that their voices would be listened to. It wouldn't just be a nice exhibition. Actually, we can change things if you, if you trust us and come and work with us. Um, so... Uh, as a result of the consultation, the architects have intru introduced gender-neutral signage to an outdoor swimming pool that was near completion. And for this project... Um, I only got these designs this week, so they're, I'm not really supposed to be sharing them, so please don't tell anybody in England. Um, <laughs> for this project, which was at an earlier stage in development, the young people have worked with the architects to help them better understand how they access spaces. And as a result, the designs have been torn up and redrawn twice with the considerations of Project Indigo worked into the designs. So for the Britannia Leisure Centre, the architects will not just get the signage right, but they also plan to introduce gender-neutral changing spaces on every level in the Leisure Centre, which is something that the young people said that they wanted. So as well as these young people regularly now using the museum and feeling comfortable, um, as a result of the project, some of the young people are still working with the policy team on the transgender inclusive policy, and some of them are now working with the hate crime teams to help them to better understand um, and to work on writing policy about combating abuse and promoting tolerance and, and, and cohesion. And I've recently learned that the architects um, working on the leisure centres in Hackney are using the model that we developed in Hackney to help them to train their staff, their architects, about considerations when working with LGBT communities. And they're also using this model um, as the basis of the redesign of the leisure centres across P uh, Portsmouth, or it might be Plymouth, I think I've written it down wrong, I can't remember which, but it's very different to Hackney. It's not as diverse and it's a port town in the UK, it's, very, it's more rural, uh, but has lots of kind of poverty, um, kind of similar challenges, but they're using this as a template to, to work in a similar way there. So... Um that's it really, they're the two case studies that I want to present and then I've got about 10 pages of all the things that I wanted to share with you. Um, but I think I've crystallised, no, I think I've crystallised it down to four, four points. Um, because I don't have a toolkit of how to do community engagement, because each museum and each area is completely different and has its own challenges and opportunities for residents. But I guess that's the point really, that one size doesn't, doesn't fit all. Um, and that true community engagement means working with your organisation, your staff, your local government and local, if you can, I've had some interesting conversations about people who don't have the same opportunities within local government um, as we do, so I recognise it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but to feel your way with your own communities and to find the right fit for you. Um, and so the four points that I wanted to leave you with are... 
the importance of embedding community engagement across the whole organisation. So there was a big move, maybe about 10 years ago, for every museum to have a community engagement team or a community engagement officer, and we had one in the museum. Um, but on our journey over 15 years, this hasn't worked. Um, because that work, even in a, an amazingly engaged organisation like Hackney Museum, people go off in different directions because there's so much to do. And that person gets left with all the community engagement, which is great because they're usually the right person for the job, but it's not embedded. So it didn't work for us. So when we had a big restructure a few years ago, which was we, had, we lost lots of staff, we lost even more of our tiny funds, what we did was we tore up all the job descriptions across the museum and we put community engagement on every single job description. So all four of us in the museum, from the schools officer, me, the learning manager, the collections and exhibitions officer, that's one job doing six exhibitions and looking after all of our collections, um, and the museum manager, we all have community engagement as the second thing down in all of our job descriptions. Um, and that's been so crucial in exhibitions like the Young Men exhibition where you can be very responsive and do things quickly because you're all mo moving together and you're all building relationships together. The second thing is about um, ownership, um, who the outputs of projects are really benefiting. Are they really benefiting communities or are they just benefiting the museum and helping us to kind of show that we're ticking boxes and reaching as many communities as possible? What are the real benefits? Who holds the real power in the relationships that you're, you're developing with communities? They just have provo provocations, really. Uh, we've, we've spent a lot of time, actually, in the last um, maybe five or six years working with academics in universities um, to, to try and measure the impact, because measuring the impact of this work is very difficult. So I don't have any evidence. We've, we've had um, somebody's written a thesis about the social impact of Hackney Museum, which I'd quite happily share with you. Uh, we're also being studied, um, somebody's doing an anthropology PhD and looking at the museum as an activist organisation operating within the state and looking at what activism means when you're kind of tied to the council and what you have to do working for the government, but actually the potential to do things a bit differently and to agitate from within. So that will be something that we can share as soon as it's, it's written up. Um, so universities really need us because we can contribute to their research, um, but we really need them. So I have no qualms about stealing resources from universities who have more money than museums, um, taking their funds, doing community engagement with them and for them. Um, Oh, on the subject of funding, that's another one of my points. We should be challenging, especially in the UK, and this is something I don't have time for, but I always say everything that I do speak at about challenging funding streams and how funding is allocated because so much of it is temporary and project-based, which means that the good work of community engagement isn't sustainable because you can't develop a good relationship, a long-lasting relationship in two years or six months or the life of the... That, that's, it's long-term work, so we should be challenging funders to think differently about how they fund projects that don't become just tick-box projects, but actually look at museums like Hackney Museum and the tiny funds that we're working on and give us core staff and core funding for more of us to work in a more engaged way. Not just for me, but this is something that's felt across the sector in the UK is that we should be funding the core and not for freelancers to dip in and dip out because those relationships disappear with freelancers. So that's something that I'm, that I'm interested in as well and I'd like to change about funding. Um, five, take risks. If you haven't got any funding, just do it anyway. If it feels right, it means that it probably is right. Um, and what we found with the LGBT project is I was doing that project, making it part of my job for about two years. And when we started to make a real impact with what we were doing, then the funding came. Then people wanted to give us money. People wanted to give Project Indigo money because they wanted to help. So we were doing it anyway and not waiting for the funding to come in. Um, and if the local government doesn't support it, we do it anyway as well, but we just do it very quietly because we should be collecting controversial material. We should be collecting far-right material. We should be collecting things so that we have got them in the future to talk about. We need to be collecting all sides of those stories. Um, and my final point is that we couldn't have done a lot of our work over the last... Um, we've really kind of ramped it up in the last three or four years. We couldn't have done a lot of that without Twitter. Um, Twitter has just been our... Just, it's been amazing for being able to network with local councillors and the mayor. It's a direct route to getting people to know what you're doing. So we never take social media for granted and we're all over social media. So if you're interested, don't look at our... This is our website. 
It's a council website, so it's really dire and difficult to get through. There's lots of interesting stuff on there, um, but it's, it's not a very engaging site. But all of our collections are digitised and online if you're interested. We've got a, a YouTube page where our community films are shown. There's lots of um, films there about what is community. What does it mean in Hackney where you've got a synagogue next to a mosque? Like, how do the communities work together and talk together? So there's interesting films on there. We write teachers' resources, um, so I've written about 10 or 15 resources about African and Caribbean history on Hackney. They're all online as well. And, uh, yeah, just follow us on all of those, in all of those different spaces. Um, and, yeah, don't be afraid to shout about your work and elbow your way into meetings and just demand that people listen to you and help you, because <laughs> that's pretty much what I've done to, to try and kind of make sure that the people that I'm working with actually get real benefits for them and, and not just for the museum. But that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>